From 12 News, your local election headquarters, this is Newsmakers. Governor Dan McKee survived a tough Democratic primary challenge. Now he faces Republican challenger Ashley Kalis in the fall campaign. With the November election barely six weeks away, what is Kalis's vision for Rhode Island on issues like education, taxes, and truck tolls? This week on Newsmakers, a closer look at this year's GOP ticket in Rhode Island. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics editor Ted Nisi. On the second half of the program, we're going to have the Republican candidates for Lieutenant Governor and Secretary of State. But joining us on the first half is Republican candidate for Governor Ashley Kalis. Welcome back to the program. Thank you for having me back. I want to start with education. You had a big announcement this week on your education plan. Yeah. As part of that, you want to give kids who attend failing schools the op option to attend better ones in neighboring districts. So first, just sort of a uh, basic question here. How do you define neighboring school? In other words, yeah. can kids from Providence go to Barrington? It depends. So what we would do is, and we'll talk about, we need to do two things in the state. We need to actually get education reform done and do it this time. Stick with it. Because what we haven't done is stick with education reform. So that's a long-term project, something that's going to take seven or eight years. Uh, Rhode Islanders deserve somebody that's honest with them about the hard work that's necessary for education reform. And in the meantime, you cannot trap a child in a failing school. And that is where we talk about public school choice, which is what you're referring yeah. to. And so what I would say is first you start with within the district and then moving from within the district and if there are seats available and there should be transportation within the district uh, provided to that child. Then you move to county and then from there um, you move broader if, if, if there is that availability. So it sounds like it could be a wide net. You could have students from Providence. Um, uh, the option could go to Barrington. They could go to East Greenwich, they could go to North Kingstown, is that right? If the seats are available, there would be a, a system where you would tear through. And other places do this in the country very successfully. We're actually... Well, don't we already do it here? Uh, you don't have it uh, institutionalized in terms of what we what we can do. So that's not something that you necessarily can do. And it is important well, to you have... Well, you can. If you have a student that is in Portsmouth and they want to take a, a certain path, they can transfer to North Kingstown. Right, but that is, that is optional and it is not institutionalized within statute and is not something that it comes from the department. So this is also why things like the constitutional right to quality education matters, is that there, you need to have some of the norms institutionalized so that we can make that possible for every child. And, you know, when we talk about the failing schools and the idea is that the schools will be um, emptying out, as school choice and public school choice in particular it makes people nervous. And the reality is we are not going to be giving up on failing schools. In my plan, we provide more assistance, and empirically, you do not see that everybody leaves a failing school. It is a community project with the state to turn that school around. So when you say you'd be providing more assistance, the money follows the student. So if a student goes to another district, aren't you pulling the funding away from that failing school? And so what the state can do is they can provide more funding. So with a school that is, is failing, what happened in Massachusetts is that school was given more uh, funds. And so that speaks to reforming the school funding formula, which is something that we also need to do if we talk about leveling the playing field. We tried to do that, but we really haven't gone all the way. So we need to reform the funding formula so we can account for things like needing to help schools that are, are failing. Um, that's what you do in a funding formula or having a fund available available within the Department of Education to make sure that we can can do that. When you announced your education plan, reporters asked for copies of it and you said it was on the it was on the printer. Are they done printing? I believe so. I think we're also posting it. So the more importantly, because I want to make sure I understand that for reporters it's important to have the plan, but it's really important for all of Rhode Island to have it. So going to my website is where we will find is that it they there are posted. Now? I I'll have to ask the tech team, but I believe it should be there. Uh, and if it isn't, I'll make sure that we get it there very quickly. <laughs> okay. And I, I suggest that people read through the plan. And if there are additional questions, send them to, uh, them to us and we'll be responsive about it. But let me talk about the plan in general. Briefly, oh. because we have a lot of ground to cover. Okay, all right. <laughs> well, it's interesting, but it does take a while. So reading the plan will be important. And what I will say is that we know the steps that need to be taken for education reform. The path was already blazed by Massachusetts. And what we need to do is we need to do the hard work to follow those steps. So we need parental involvement. 
we need principal autonomy. We need to fix the uh, funding formula so that it is fair. So what you get with me as governor is, is someone who will do the hard work to get education reform done. We keep on seeing report after report that is emphasizing the same thing, the same elements that are needed here that happened in Massachusetts. Um, Ashley, when we sat down on the day you launched your campaign, I asked you what Republican governor you admired most. You mentioned, you said it was a hard question, but you said Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. As you know, Governor DeSantis has been making headlines in our backyard with this situation with the migrants uh, sent to Martha's Vineyard. He's now being sued by those migrants. Um, I'm wondering, you know, as someone who has, mired, has said you admire the work he's done in Florida, what did you make of, of that decision by the, the governor well, to make up that point that I, way? I, yeah, I said I, I really don't support uh, using people as pawns in political stunts. I don't. And I, at the same time, when we look at the economic policy of Florida, you have an economy that is booming. You have businesses that are leaving to go there. And we should have that in Rhode Island so we can learn from other places for pol about policy that has worked. So if we're talking education policy, then we should look to Governor Weld in uh, Massachusetts. I know that's 1990s, right? But let's, a Republican we governor. We both grew up in Massachusetts. Okay, we know so Governor you know Weld Okay, well, let, well, that's a Republican <laughs> governor that actually was able uh, to get education reform done. And he was the first Republican elected in 20 years, and one of the one of the things that he was, he'll be remembered for is education reform. So would I like to follow those steps in terms of passing education reform and actually doing it done like Governor Wilk? Absolutely. Now, that wasn't just his work. Everybody had to work together to get it done. There was a commitment that was bipartisan uh, to actually deliver on the promises of the legislation. And there was a constitutional right. Let me ask you, too, uh, before I give it back to Tim, while we're talking about Republican governors, you mentioned Massachusetts. We have a, a clear divide in your party just over the border with Governor Baker is not supporting Jeff Deal, who is your party's nominee. Are you supporting Mr. Deal uh, in the governor's race in Mass? I'm not, I'm not even involved in that. I'm so focused on Rhode Island. Um, I, I haven't been asked. I am not part of that, um, that conversation. And the reality is that I'm focused on policies and I'm focused on Rhode Island issues. I'd love to talk more about Rhode Island ra rather than the rest of the, the country or other states. Well, let's talk about Rhode Island. Uh, actually, a federal judge this week ruled that the state's truck tolling program is unconstitutional. We caught up with Governor Dan McKee the day after that decision. Here's what he had to say. Any doubt that you're going to appeal? We're going to review the, uh, the you know, the, the, the um, the, you know the ruling, and uh, then we'll take it from there. So we'll, at this point in time, we're we're in, we're in the review process. Rhode Island needs infrastructure. Uh, I support the roadworks program, and uh, uh, we expect that that will continue to um, uh, to that DOT is going to continue doing that work. So as you could hear, he was non-committal yeah. on appealing the decision, but many believe that they are going to appeal. The House Speaker is asking yeah. to do that. That means if you become governor, you would inherit that legal battle. Would you pull the plug on it? And so I said that I would, I would stop the appeal, but I think that uh, the governor is under review until special interests tell him what he should say. You know, Mayor uh, McKee was a sensible moderate, and he would not recognize Governor McKee. Uh, in terms of schools, Mayor McKee was for charter schools. Governor McKee lets, uh, you know, unions write his education policy. Mayor McKee was for uh, fighting, uh, you know, the energy companies. Uh, Governor McKee is going to oversee one of the largest electricity hikes in our history. I mean, there is a clear difference between who the mayor was and who he is now, and he has just been corrupted by power. And, but the question was about tolls, so if you're going to pull the plug on tolls, there would be a money gap to make up? Yeah, so do it? let's talk about, so we do not have a revenue problem, we have a spending problem. And what ends up happening is we knew that, that there were a bunch of warnings about the fact that that was unconstitutional and it was bad law. And instead it went forward anyway. And another part of the story is that $7 million was spent of taxpayers' money with a politically collect, uh, connected law firm to fight a case that was lost. Actually, the state spent $8.4 million. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I make it even worse. And it, could, and it could be more money, right? And so the reality is when you, when you go to gimmicks to protect special interests, ultimately the taxpayers pay the bill. And that is what we're going to see here is that I, I really believe that good governance matters. And what we see is at the end of the day, when you try to do something that is not 
legal or constitutional, eventually there are consequences. And instead of pushing this along, we need to just stop it. The case was lost, and the reality is that we need to be responsible in budgeting. We need to look for not just spending money, but getting a return on investment. Uh, it, abortion is shot to the top, one of the top issues in the country since the Dobbs decision, and it's led to a lot of push among Democrats in the state to put this they call it the Equality and Abortion Coverage Act, you're familiar with it, into next year's budget, which would allow Medicaid and the state health insurance plan to fund elective abortions. You, you've said you're pro-life, you do not um, support late-term abortions, but if Democrats who will almost certainly still control the legislature put that in the budget, would you veto the budget? I want to address something because I, I don't want to be misunderstood, is that I am personally pro-life. However, the right to an abortion was codified in state law in 2019. I will do nothing to change the law. You can't say, I, I've said, you need to follow the law, you need to respect the law. It goes both ways. I will not change it. If you are asking if I support taxpayer-funded abortions, I do not. Would you so you would veto the budget if they put that in? If next that year? comes through, you would. I, 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 if that comes through. But I think that the important thing and what is happening here is something that that I want to talk about, which is I will do nothing to change the law. So fear and um, making things up is just not something that is really fo focused on the truth. And I think the truth matters. Character matters in this election. And what we see in the governor is someone that is incompetent and somebody that shows a lack of character. And the reason that I say lack of character is let's talk about the FBI investigation and what that means for people's. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, but let's, let's say the abortion policy. I am, question. but here, hold, hold on, because I've been very clear in what I've said, and the reality is that what what I've said is some is sometimes uh, being distorted. And I'm going to be very clear in it, and that is an issue of of character. And so, when you are looking to a governor, you want to have somebody that respects and follows the law. That is really, really important. That takes a respect for institutions, and it takes well, a... Take, take Governor McKee out of it for a second. Last week, you, you said how much you admired Helena Folks, who came so close. Helena Folks, toward the end of her campaign, repeatedly said she felt that this, this was a priority for her. She said it, it's not right for women who are getting their health coverage through the state employee plan or Medicaid not to be able to have abortions funded. You disagree with Helena Folks on that. Right, and you know, talk about character, so let's talk about character, is that the way that Helena Folks was treated um, was unacceptable on, um, on the primary night. And I'll remind folks if they did not see that video, which is when Helena called. The phone call. We showed it last week. So oh, I you did? Okay. Know no, but, that, but, that is, but if we're talking about character, all, sometimes you get a view into a politician that is unscripted um, and not controlled by staff. And what you saw with Governor McKee is the real Governor McKee in his treatment of her to say, hang up on her. You don't do that as a leader. All right, we have a couple minutes left. I, I have to ask you about this. Uh, you had a TV ad out where you claim parents of K through 12 students are paying nearly $900 uh, for school supplies a year. I've heard from some viewers who want to know where you got that it number. Was the retail so it's actually on the bottom. If you look, that the source is there. It's the retail association. Are they saying you, that it's more? You have kids. Do you I, pay that? I actually because I, I have to tell you, you're doing it wrong. If you're spending nine hundred dollars well, on have, school supplies, I have three boys, and um, it's. You mean I? Oh, are you telling me that I'm not shopping appropriately? It, well, <laughs> it seems like a high figure that you put in an ad to make a, a point. So I wanted to know if this viewer wanted to know where you. Yeah, got it's that. a retail association. It is actually sourced on the ad. Talk about being transparent. So if you look at the bottom, you should be able to see what the source is. And let's talk about the overall sentiment, which is that uh, it is hard to make it right now. Everything is unaffordable, even the basic necessities that you need as a family. I can tell you that uh, food prices are just out of control. Electricity prices are about ready to shoot up. So whether uh, you agree, I have, you know, I have three boys. They need a lot of stuff. They're growing a lot. Um, and... The reality is it is really hard for working families. And what the government can do, we can do two things. We can deal with the long-term issue of inflation, which requires at a state level growth. And then the other responsibility is to provide immediate and targeted relief. So instead of providing corporate giveaways, which is what we see from Dan McKee in a soccer stadium, what we see um, with the Superman building, that is, that is a continuing course of behavior instead of providing immediate relief to the taxpayers, to working families. 
families targeted immediate relief, which would have been before suspending the gas taxes as a flat tax that is regressive in nature, or making sure that there was relief in terms of um, electricity prices. And so that wasn't done while at the same time, so no immediate relief, corporate welfare, while professing that we have this amazing surplus. So your actions show where your priorities are, and for Dan McKee, his priorities are with corporate welfare, insiders, and giving away bonuses so that he can buy the election. Okay. He is not worth right. working families. Actually, I'm going to go to a break. Just real quick, have you done any, conducted any uh, internal polling? You have. <laughs> you have. You have. Yeah, I'm such. I am such a bad teller. <laughs> yes, of course. I, yes, we have. What does it say? Oh, come on. You think I'm? Mean, that's well, why it's if it called were good, If it were good, you would tell us. I, well, I, yes. So can you it win? Is, people yes. wonder if you can. We haven't seen a Republican well, win a state or federal race since 2006, and people wonder. They see that you're running a serious campaign, but wonder, can a Republican win? In hey, this don't state? give a campaign speech. We have a few <laughs> seconds to go before uh, we go to a break. Absolutely. Helena Folk showed that that there is that Dan McKee is deeply unpopular, and so we can win. We know know that we can win. We are showing a lot of progress and it is getting very, very close. And you know what? Um, coming from nothing and building a business, I have always been under, underestimated. And I would say that at the end of the day, in business and in life, I have always come out and top and I intend to win and I will win. All right. And if they're going to underestimate me, um, let them do that. We Ashley, can win. Ashley Kalis, Republican candidate for governor. It's good having you back on the program. Thanks for joining us. When we come back, we'll have Republican candidate for Lieutenant Governor Aaron, uh, Aaron Gukian and Pat Cordelessa. He's a Republican candidate for Secretary of State. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. From 12 News, your local election headquarters, this is Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside Ted Nisi. For the second half of the program, we welcome Aaron Gukian. He's right to my left. He's a Republican candidate for lieutenant governor. And Pat Cordelessa, he's a Republican candidate for secretary of state. 60 seconds or less, gentlemen, I'll start with you, Mr. Gukian. Why do you want to be lieutenant governor? Well, when my parents, when I was growing up, my father's a local 51 plumber, my mom's a respiratory therapist, and they always like two ships in a night. Um, that my father worked at the power plant in Connecticut, my mom, uh, you know, at the ER emergency room, and, and you know, all I knew was get up and grind, hard work, and when I used to complain, my dad would say get up earlier. So I don't see that right now. I see apathy, and I see a appointed lieutenant governor who's really nowhere to be found, and she won't debate. So I had to stand up for Rhode Island, um, native from East Greenwich, Wall of Honor in the high school, went to Connecticut College, uh, majored in music. I have two master's degrees, MBA, because uh, I couldn't get to the NBA, and uh, mass, I'm an <laughs> Tall opera singer. Here, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm six seven. I've got my wife's a professor at Johnson Wales University. I got three daughters, and I'm just proud to be here and proud to. Uh, fight for Rhode Islanders. All right, Aaron, and uh, the same question to you, Mr. Cordelessa, 60 seconds or less. Why do you want to be Secretary of State? I think at this time in, uh, within uh, the community and in national uh, situations with Secretary of State and the elections, I want to take it uh, myself to get involved, to give the, the uh, voters of Rhode Island an opportunity that I want to run this office independently and not have any influence. And I think showing my past history of uh, challenging uh, corruption in, in Rhode Island and Providence, that I can be the person that they can trust and have that confidence in me that I can run this department uh, on the up and up and keep uh, private or corporate influence out of the Secretary of State's office. All right, so I want to ask you guys a couple basic, I'll call them just democracy questions that have come up in recent years that uh, were problems, and I'll start with you on this, Pat. Do you think Joe Biden legitimately won the 2020 election? Yes, he did. I, um, I think uh, in Rhode Island, he definitely it was fine in the, in the election. Uh, I didn't see any uh, improprieties. It might have been a few things that I would have changed, maybe gave the opportunity of candidates post-election to look at some signatures on mail ballots that might have had uh, you know, an impact on their campaigns. But all in all, I think it was uh, legitimate. Mr. Gukian, same question. Do you think uh, President Biden legitimately won the election? Yes. Yes. And uh, what w I'll stay with you on this, Mr. Gukian. What was your reaction to the events on January 6th and what we have learned since about that? Yeah, we've had some really unfortunate circumstances in the country, and that was one of them. Um, also, we had a lot of riots in our cities. Um, so it's, it's really important that we have leaders that have qualifications, that have dealt with certain situations. I was a special assistant to Governor Kachiri and the First Lady. You know, experience matters. You can't rush experience. You can't teach experience. 
and right now the appointed lieutenant governor is way over her head. Uh, Mr. Cordelessa, you mentioned it yourself, secretaries of state often a sleepy office, but have been at the center of some of these, including what wound up lighting the fuse on January 6th. What was your reaction to that and what we've learned since? Um, I was appalled. Um, I, I believe in the Constitution. Uh, I'm a strong believer in law and order. As a candidate, um, I believe in, in President Biden's uh, uh, open tent philosophy that our Republicans are included, that he would accept them, and I feel that I fit that criteria that I, I would definitely... Uh, you know, condemn attacking uh, government property. Um, it, 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 it did nothing, it, it gained nothing for, for whoever was looking to, to gain anything from it. It was a, a black eye uh, on the Constitution of the United States. And do you think Donald Trump holds any responsibility for what happened that day? I think uh, there's several people that hold responsibility. I'm asking you about Donald Trump. Well, he's the ultimate, uh, he was the ultimate, uh, the President of the United States, so if, 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 if they find evidence that he had anything to do with that, or Corroborated in that, then you have to be held accountable. Um, Mr. Gukian, uh, Bob Healy famously yeah. wanted to scuttle the ship when it came to the <laughs> office of the lieutenant governor. Is that something you would do? do you, would you keep the office open? Well, obviously, the impossible happened. Governor Mundo was elevated to the Biden administration, and, and the lieutenant governor became the governor. I want to have a help center. I want to help uh, people navigate through the state system and cut through the red tape. Right now we have so many small businesses that are just inundated with licenses and fees. And um, you know, I, I have a good policy and a good way to just kind of help people get to the, the people, the good people who are working in the state office and uh, you know, uh, hopefully expedite. Because if you're gonna fee people and you're gonna tax people, the next thing you don't wanna do is take their time. We're doing both in Rhode Island. I have the experience and I can uh, convene a group of experts and uh, try to uh, bring the straight uh, state move forward. Do you know the um, operating budget of the office of lieutenant governor? 1.2 million. Is that about right? Is that not enough? Or would you reduce that budget? Well, I think with the help center, um, if I have seven to eight specialists um, uh, working from Rhode Island uh, that can again have help navigate the state system, we have small business, long-term health care, and emergency management. I have experience or I'll hire experience that we'll be able to support and manage up to the governor and the legislature. And, uh, you know, I can't wait to get started, uh, you know, come in January. Pat, uh, you've seen the headlines undoubtedly, you've commented on it. That we had quite a mess toward the end of the Democratic primary between the Secretary of State's office and the Board of Elections. We had errors on the ballot machines. And, and uh, as much along with the, the issues themselves was the, the confusion clearly in the public, even candidly among reporters and officials, about who is responsible for what when it comes to elections administration in Rhode Island. Uh, you know, Republicans obviously had a field day with that, but I'm curious, if you became Secretary of State, what needs to happen in your view to, I don't know, have less of a messy fighting relationship between those two offices? I agree. Um, I, I would, what I would do, I would implement more of an uh, intense uh, review of the uh, responsible parties, as they say, make sure it's on, it's on the books that if it's the Board of Elections or if it's Secretary of State, who, who looks at that ballot that goes in before it goes into those type of machines. It was a, definitely an embarrassment having a 2018 ballot in 2022 uh, you know, primary. So, of course, we, I, I, from what I understand, um, the Secretary of State's office is supposed to review the ballot before it hands it over to the Board of Elections f officials and then they install it. And of course, I would definitely hold the company that has the contract. Um, I would seriously look into that after, this, after the election and uh, maybe put it all to bid again to another you know, more efficient company. So Secretary Gorbea has tried to argue uh, th that, and her folks have said clearly, they don't think she had any responsibility in her office for the review of those names, and it was all on the Board of Elections. Do you think it was all on the Board of Elections, or do you think there is a role for the Secretary of State's office there? No, I, I don't think it was on the Board of Elections. I think they did the due diligence. I think it was the Secretary of State's office. And again, when you have, I will never use that office to enhance my political agenda or my political inspirations. I think that's what happened here. You had someone that was focusing on something else as the Secretary of State uh, running for governor and, over, and just lost track of responsibility. But that, that office seemed to have several problems on and on and continuously. So I would, uh, myself, would definitely be overseeing everything, including, you know, the elections and primaries and in general elections. I mean, 
it's just what we're getting paid for. I got to give the taxpayers what they're paying me to do and my staff. And if I'm not competent, then they should throw me out. That's the way I look at it. We'll play that back if you get elected. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron, as you pointed out, you work for uh, Republican Governor Don Kachiri. Mm. Was there anything you disagreed with him on? Uh, 38 Studios, you know, now that I'm, uh, you know, I, I went to... Did um, you disagree with him on it at the time? Because it's no, really young, easy to say that right now. Well, I was a young man, and I didn't have the background. I, uh, after the governor's office, I became a banker. I rose to vice president. I then got an MBA at night. So I didn't understand the collateral piece and, and a lot of the, the problems that kind of uh, occurred with that. I, I, was, I was his body guy. I was his day-to-day. -day. I made sure the citations and proclamations he got there on time. I worked with the executive security detail of the state police. And just to say, you know, I, I want to refund the police, not defund the police like the appointed lieutenant governor would like to do. All right, uh, Pat, we only have 30 seconds left, sure. so just make this real quick. Uh, Rhode Island's voter ID law. Would you keep uh, it? You would. You would keep it. Photo ID. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also clean up a few of the issues to get on the voter rolls. There's some things there that are really strange, and it's you know electric bill or utility bill or uh, a credit card without a photo to get on the voter roll. That's an issue that I want to really clean up. All right, Pat Cordalesa, he's Republican candidate for Secretary of State, and Aaron Gukian, he's Republican candidate for Lieutenant Governor. I thank you for watching the program. Ashley Kalis was our first half guest. You can catch it on WPRI.com if you missed it. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.